Complex fills were traditionally used for larger areas where you wanted to have a fill stitch fill in a good chunk of the space. Um, it, now, because stitch types are pretty much unlocked and you can have almost any stitch type for almost any kind of element within limits, um, you can do a lot of things with complex fills that you couldn't do before. The first uh, complex fill that I want to look at is the traditional method, which um, is how we digitized complex fills in earlier versions of our software, um, and a lot of us still do, um, not just because of habit, but if you're dealing with a complex fill or a larger area um, and you only need one stitch direction, it can be a little bit faster to use the traditional method. So let's take a look at that. There are fewer steps, and then uh, we'll take a look at how all of that works. So first I want to open a design uh, or a graphic file. It's located in the graphics folder that's in the designs folder that's loaded with your software and it's fills.bmp and it's lots of really exciting shapes um, <laughs> but what they actually are really good for, for are figuring out how complex fills work um, and how to best uh, digitize them and select um, stitch directions that will help alleviate some of, of the issues with so many lines of stitching. So to start, we need to select a complex fill. Um, I'm going to use the traditional input method. If that's not available to you immediately, you can click and hold on the fly out. It's the first one in the list. I'm going to let go. Uh, but first, you'll notice that it has just a single stitch direction line running across it. Um, whereas the unifill has multiple ones, so that's one of the big differences. Um, you can add them back in later if you need more, but uh, once you add one stitch direction line to a complex fill traditional input method, um, you're done, you're ready to move on to the next thing. So that's why it can be a little bit faster. So the first thing that we want to do is digitize around the shape. So let me zoom in here. Um, this one I'm going to start with a straight point. I pretty much start everything with a straight point. I'm going to hold Alt to constrain my line angle. I'm going to go around. Down, so I just trace around the whole uh, design, except for the last little chunk. I do not need to come back over and click another point over here. I can hit Enter, and it will fill in that form. And once I do that, it is now asking me on the bottom, um, so I'm looking right down, oops, sorry. I'm looking right down here, right down there. Um, it's asking me to input a hole. This one doesn't have a hole, and even the cursor is kind of asking me to input a hole. I don't have one, so I can hit enter uh, as soon as I get my focus back. There we go. Uh, and now it's asking me for my entry point. So I can say where I want to start, where I want to stop, and uh, what stitch direction I want to have. Um, I'm going to do something that I don't particularly like. I'm going to go straight across. It's not bad, um, and it's really easy to predict but uh, it's not going to give you as clean of an edge, and I'll show you why. So uh, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to duplicate that, and I'm going to move it up here. We'll move on to the next one, so a different shape, and then I'll come back and, and show you those stitch directions. All right, so I'm going to... I'm going to start this one over here. So I'm going to start here. I'm going to go around. I'm going to hold Alt to constrain. Doesn't matter if you digitize clockwise or counterclockwise. I'm going to hit Enter to finish the shape. So I'm not coming back up here and clicking. I'm just going to hit Enter to finish the state shape. It's going to ask for a hole. I don't have one, so I hit Enter again. It's going to ask me for an entry point, an exit point, and a stitch direction. All right, so I'm going to do 
this and we'll look at what's a good idea and what's a bad idea now. So let me duplicate that, move that up here. So now I've got kind of the originals below and then stuff that's a little bit easier to look at above. I'm going to go into properties. I'm going to turn off the underlay just so that I can see the needle penetrations of the top stitching. So it's a little bit easier for you guys. And I'm going to go to a slightly darker or a slightly darker gray than the background. That'll work. And then I'm going to turn on uh, the expanded points so that you can see the needle penetrations. And what am I looking at? Um, so with this, you are looking at a little plus sign for any needle penetration. And what you'll notice is that a lot of the needle penetrations for something that is going completely horizontal, um, at least if you're dealing with a square, so this square, a lot of the uh, needle penetrations are falling on either side and there aren't a ton of needle penetrations on the top and the bottom. Um, what's good about that, what's bad about that? Um, good about it, uh, it, again, it's easy to predict the push and the pull of the fabric. You know which direction everything's going to pull. You know what direction it's going to push. It's going to pull in on the sides and, and push up and on the top and the bottom. What's bad about it is uh, the top and the bottom aren't going to be as clean of a line as they could be. So if I change my stitch direction to 45 or 60 or something like that, then I begin to sink more needle penetrations along the edge. So you'll see that this is a lot darker as before. So let me hit undo. So before I only had a needle penetration every what, 40 points? Yep, my stitch length is 40. So every 40 points, except on the very end, um, that's all I'm sinking a stitch. So those longer stitches may start to, to show a little bit more on the edge as opposed to here where you have a very clean penetration. Uh, here, so if I change this back to 60, now we've got some nicer, cleaner edges. Um, unfortunately, when I did that, let's go into 3D. Let's draw this over. It's gonna sew up, travel, and then sew back down and meet up with itself. And you'll notice how they're slightly different colors. Um, this is something it shows on screen this way very dramatically um, in the final sew out it, it may or may not show and to some extent that depends on the thread. Um, when you're sewing the opposite direction you're changing the twist of the thread um, that can change how light can hit it so yes it can look a little darker or a little lighter um, that's uh, slightly less common or um, it doesn't happen nearly as often as um, if you don't stabilize the area well, where those two pieces meet back up, you're sewing back towards things you've sewn before, you might have a slight gap there. Um, so if I can push in all one direction and not meet back up with myself, I'm gonna be happier with it. So let's look at this and see if we can modify this to actually work a little bit better that way. So if I move my exit point to kind of stick to the far end away from my stitch direction line. So if I were to kind of do a right angle and then slide it, I can get to this corner. And now this piece can sew all at once and not meet back up with itself. This is going to sew a little bit smoother. So how do I deal with this piece? Um, right now I'm exiting kind of like I said, I'm, I'm going across, but I still have to meet back up with myself. So what I will do, and this sounds a little goofy, um, but what I will occasionally do is I will hold a, a pencil or a pen up to my monitor and I'll kind of run it across and see, okay, is there somewhere uh, that I can do that without coming back on itself? So I don't have a ruler that I can show you on screen right now, or uh, rulers also work. I don't have a pencil that I can show you on screen right now. Um, so what I'll do is I will create um, just a big line. And let's make it yellow. 
so it kind of looks like a pencil. And then I'm going to slide this on top just so that you can see it a little bit better. So uh, if I were to slide this across, would this one work? Start in this corner and then slide it up. Keep going. So if this was the pencil that I was holding, can I get through the whole thing without having to meet back up with myself? Yes, I can. I never cut anything off. Whereas if I did something like this, as soon as I get here, I've now cut off two areas. So when I'm deciding on a stitch direction, that's often what I'll do. Now, uh, you can kind of cheat a little bit when you have a shape like this. If you'll notice you've got kind of these two angles, if you go somewhere in between them, in between them um, something like this, where it's kind of in between those two angles, it will work. So let's do that. Let's take that stitch direction, kind of go in between those two angles. There we go. And then let's get rid of this line now that we don't need it. And now as this sews in, it will sew all in one direction and I'm not beating, meeting back up with myself. So those are kind of the things that I keep in mind when I'm digitizing. Um, other things that I will keep in mind when choosing a stitch direction. Uh, I don't really like a stitch direction that falls into the grain of my garment. Um, and most garments have a vertical grain, so you'll notice uh, on a lot of the things that I do either on screen or if you happen to see one of the designs that I digitized, um, I don't have a lot of vertical stitch directions unless I have a really good reason to have it. Um, other things, uh, if I'm going to be sewing over it uh, with something else like lettering, I will try to have stitch directions that don't line up with the stitch directions that are going to be going on top of it. So for lettering, I like to have my stitches at a slight angle so that, because um, if the stitches line up exactly, they'll fall into each other. Is that desirable? Usually not. Can you use that to you some advantage? Yeah, if you're creating a blend, that's one way to do it. Um, we're not doing that right now. We want nice, clean, crisp edges. So I will go at slight angles to each other. If I go at 90 degree angles, the top stitching can pull gaps in the stitching underneath. Okay, so go at slight angles and uh, you, you'll be a little bit better off with that and try to avoid sewing uh, into uh, stitches that you've sewn before, uh, lining up stitch direction or going at 90 degrees to those. Um, and then if you're dealing with the grain of a material, try to avoid going into the grain. Going exactly 90 degrees to the grain of a uh, garment doesn't seem to hit you as much as um, layers of stitching that go at 90 degrees to each other. All right, so let's deal with uh, let's deal with a design or a design element that has a hole. All right, so I have this right here. So I'm going to digitize around the shape. And I started with a right click. I hit enter to close that shape. Um, I tried to evenly space those. I got a little bit off. Notice it didn't really matter. Um, now it's asking for a hole. This time I have a hole. So I am going to start digitizing around that hole. Same way. Hit enter to complete the hole. Now it's asking, do I have another hole? You could create Swiss cheese with this. It will not stop asking you until you hit enter without creating another hole. So once I do that, it's saying, where's your input point? Let's say here. Where's your exit point? Let's say here. They do not have to be inside of your element. If it's outside of the element, it will go to whatever edge is closest. All right, uh, what's my stitch direction? Uh, let's go here. Is there anything that I can do that won't meet up with itself? No, there's not. Um, because it's got a hole, I'm going to meet back up with myself somewhere. Now here is a little tiny bit where it meets back up with itself and comes back down. Right there. So I can stop that by moving this a little bit more and now that won't happen. All right, 
So that is the traditional method um, for inputting a complex fill. Here's kind of another uh, fun shape where you'd have to figure out a stitch direction. So we'll come down. This is a great, um, they're not the most exciting shapes, but they are good for figuring out um, good stitch directions and kind of good practices on inputting. It's great practice for using a complex fill. Is there a hole? No. Hit enter. Entry point here, exit point here, stitch direction. I'm going to go in between these two. And now I can fill the whole thing in all at once. All right. So uh, complex fills traditionally are, again, used for larger areas. Um, a fill stitch definitely is, but the complex fill tool and the fill stitch are now separated. So don't be worried, uh, oh, I digitized a letter using the wrong tool. Um, if it works and you can get the stitch type you want, that works, that's fine. Um, people who have been doing it for a long time will uh, probably still go back to what they've done for forever, even though there are new tools available and um, you aren't stuck with some of the habits that some of us are stuck with. Um, and even if you do have those habits, um, every now and then just give one of these others a shot and see if it might not better suit your digitizing style. Um, complex fill, traditional method, a very fast way to fill in a lot of stitches um, and you can have holes and you have one stitch direction, but you can edit in more later if you need to.